students in the intercultural class with Dr. Westbrook, and um, I appreciate you being here and appreciate your support today. I will tell you, I get very distracted by cell phones, and so if you could try to put them away, I'm talking to Ken Thompson. Yes, yeah, I'm sitting with Dr. Barr. I'm Ken. Are you tasting with Dr. Barr? I'm sitting with Dr. Barr. So really, I guess I'm talking to the teachers, not the students, but if you could, if you could keep your cell phones put away. Unless you have an emergency, I would completely understand that. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, just for you that don't know, the reason why Dylene and I got to go to Jordan is because the university put the bill for it. Um, and for the faculty that are here, Richard has already sent out the calls for next summer. If you're interested, I would really encourage you to look into this. Uh, the CIEE who sponsors these trips, they're incredible. They also put on student trips. And there's a center there in Jordan where there were plenty of American students while we were there, so you should look into that. The other thing I want to say is that we were only there for a week. So when I talk today about our experiences in Jordan, keep in mind we were only there a week. So I wouldn't want someone to come to like Tahlequah and say, well, I was in Tahlequah week, I understand Oklahoma. And you know, I got it down. Because it's, that's just not true. I mean, you're going to have your lived experience. You're going to catch some things and not everything. I will tell you, I tell you we've done a lot of reading. Dylene Bolt and I both have done a lot of reading. We've also maintained contact with people who are in Jordan, are native Jordanians. We asked them a lot of questions. I asked a lot of questions as, as I was putting this presentation together um, for today. And so we do have that connection still in Jordan. I do want to show you where we were while we were in Jordan. We spent the majority of our time right here in Amman, which is the capital city. It's a huge city. I mean, I'm not even talking like Tulsa city size, I'm talking like huge city size. And that's where we spent the majority of our time. We did go to the Dead Sea one afternoon, which was really, really cool. I've got a story about getting salt in my eyes, if you want to hear it later. It's a very dumb move on my part. But Dead Sea was fun. We also went to a little Bedouin village somewhere over here. And no one could tell me where it was on the map, including our bus driver. So um, I don't know how he found it, but we got there. It was a lot of like turn at this sheet, turn at this building, time, you know, kind of thing until we got there. But anyway, we got there. It was really cool. And you'll see some pictures from the Bedouin village here in a little bit. So I need to talk about sex and gender and how I operationalize those terms before I get started. A lot of people use those terms like they're the same word with the same meaning. I don't use them that way. I know a lot of people like to say gender instead of sex because, I don't know, I guess they, they're afraid you're going to confuse the noun with a verb or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> but they're not the same thing in my world. Sex is what you're born with, right? It's, it's anatomy. It's biological. It's black and white. For most people, most people it's pretty clear whether you have male anatomy or female anatomy. It's not true for all people, but for most people it's true. And so at birth you know whether you're male or female according to anatomy. Gender is different. It is a sliding scale of masculinity and femininity. And no one, I don't care what you say, no one is 100% masculine or 100% feminine. We all fall somewhere on the scale. Most people, all people, associate masculinity with men and femininity with women. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but it is the way we do it. Um, it is a sliding scale, and so all of us have a percentage of masculinity and femininity. It is learned behavior. It's socialized, right? So I just had a faculty member who had a baby a couple weeks ago. Um, she's not here. <laughs> These are my friends from the department who know her. <laughs> it wasn't Dana. Um, Cassie had a baby. Many of you know Cassie. Well, we knew Cassie was going to have a boy forever ago, right? So guess what she registered for? Blue things, right? <laughs> because that's what we're allowed to register for. When that baby came out, he got a blue blanket, you know? As he gets older, he will go to the toy store and find the blue aisle, where he will see trucks and snakes and bugs, and he will know that's what boys do. I have another niece, I consider these nieces and nephews. I have another niece, also department dad, in my department, and a girl. Same thing with her, baby Lennox wears so much pink. And if you know Baby Lennox, Christopher Copeland's baby, wears so much pink. They've already picked out her first year birthday outfit. It is pink, it involves feathers, you know, the whole thing. It has a headband, you know, the whole thing. 
So we're taught, we're socialized what it means to be masculine or feminine, and it's conditional. And those of you who sat through my leadership um, lecture about gender and leadership have already heard me say this, but how we behave depends on whom we're with, right? And so at home, I have a heterosexual partner. At home, I may be more feminine. At work, I'm, I'm a chair of a department, so I often have to do a lot of work things, right? Make a lot of big decisions. I may act more masculine because I think that will be rewarded in the workplace. And so it also depends on where you are on how you behave. So in this great land of ours, how do we decide what is masculine and what is feminine. And if I gave you time, if I had the time, you could certainly brainstorm a list. I am sure of that. But most of you are probably going to come up with this same, these same things. And that is church. Church? No. Well, I guess I can point it there. Church. Church is one place. And especially, you know, we live in the bright, shiny buckle of the Bible Belt. I imagine for most of you, there's a church or religion influence in your life. Popular culture also dictates this for us. You know, my nieces and nephews know what they want to play with based upon the commercials they see when they're watching Nick Jr., you know, or, or the TV they see on Disney. That helps them know what boys and girls do. Family helps decide that. Um, some of you have, may have mothers who always tell you, women, they always tell you women, you gotta wear lipstick, that's what women do. You know, dress nice when you go to Walmart, because you might meet your man. You know, that's being top feminine. Don't look for your man at Walmart. <laughs> and then the final thing is your friends. Your friends certainly have a lot of influence on you as well. So, how do they decide what is masculine and feminine in Jordan? The same way we do it here. The same sort of influences, right? And so let's start with religion. Their dominant religion is Islam. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. So Islam is what influences a lot of their ideas of femininity and masculinity. Something you need to know about Jordan that is different from the United States is that they don't have a separation of church, church and state there. So when you go through the court system, it's very likely you're going to go through Sharia, the, the Sharia court, which is the laws based upon the Holy Quran, the Sharia laws. And there's also the regular, like, civil kinds of courts, like what we have. Dylene is going to talk more about this. Because I would say, and Dylene sure will have her own opinion about this, I would say that the Sharia court actually probably has a little more power and influence in that country than, than, the, other, than the state court. Popular culture also influences people in Jordan. So what's their popular culture? Well, they have movies. They have Western, when I say Western movies, I'm not like talking about John Wayne, it's not like movies influenced by the Western Hemisphere, which is where we live. When I was there in the summer, Super 8 was playing in our theater. They were selling it on the street because piracy is perfectly legal there, right? So I'm walking down the street and there's a rack of DVDs and Super 8 was one of them, as was Water for Elephants that was playing here at the time. They were a dollar JD, which is a Jordanian dollar, one JD which is about $1.50 our money. So you could load up, and then you're gonna have to go to customs. But you know, I'm not saying whether I have any or not, I'm just having you with me today. There's the royal family uh, that is very influential there. Now their royal family, uh, now most of us when we think royal family, we think like the United Kingdom, right? I mean, that's the big influence that we know of that's a royal family. The royal family has way more power than the British royal family. The king there sort of acts like a president. He's got veto power when it comes to making laws. He has a lot of influence in the country. You walk into a business, you're very likely going to see him and the queen up on the wall. And you walk into the university, you're likely to see the two of them or him by himself up on the wall. I mean, you're going to see them in a lot of different places. Now, for my opinion, great. <laughs> I like this royal family. They are full of feminists. They believe in equality between the sexes, and whenever they can talk about that, they do. Now, with that said, there's only so much they can do because of culture. You know, there's only so far they can push things. But I will tell you, I very much think King is a feminist. His wife is certainly a feminist. She was born in, in the UK, and she was raised in the UK. 
His sister, the king's sister, she um, is very involved in non-government agencies where they do a lot of research on sex and gender. And I'm going to quote from some of those studies today that you'll see. And his brother is also, the king's brother is also very involved in, in equality. And so right now, great, great influence in that country. Music. They listen to a lot of music. Music dictates a lot of the of femininity and, and masculinity in that country. But let's talk about the difference between their superstars and our superstars, okay? So when you were coming in today, I was playing some music, and this person you heard was this person right here. Her name's Nancy. She's from Lebanon. Um, she is very, very popular there. The, in fact, whenever I would go buy things, I would always take a Jordanian student with me or a college student with me and ask them what to buy. And, and Rasha, the young lady who went with me, who I'm friends with on Facebook, yeah, Facebook often, and she told me to buy this CD, and she thought this person was great. Something I want you to notice about Nancy, though, how she is dressed. This is a superstar, okay? Now, head's not covered, not unusual. I saw a lot of women without their heads covered. She is, her legs are covered, though, and her arms are covered. That is very, very important. Because when it comes to dress, it's all about modesty. And that's how they, and how you interpret what the Holy Quran means by that is how you dress, right? So she's still showing a little skin, you know, but let's look at this. Okay? I mean, that's the difference, right? I mean, this is Beyonce's last album. That's Nancy's last album. If this were to come out, I can't even imagine those sorts of reactions that there would be. I mean, it wouldn't make it. It wouldn't make it to the stores, I'm sure of it. So that's a, that's a big difference. So let's go back and talk about a couple more influences, and then I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, the family tribe friend structure there. Family isn't just about your mom, your dad, and your brother, and your sister. It's not even just about your grandma, and your grandpa, and your aunt, and your uncle, and your cousins. It's about this huge tribal structure. And a lot of these people, they share the same last name. And it is very, very important who your tribe is. In Tahlequah, it's very, very important who your family is too, right? I mean, the last names matter, and they certainly matter over there. But they have a collectivist culture there. And if you haven't already talked about that intercultural, you certainly will talk about collectivist cultures and individualistic cultures. They have a very collectivist culture. Our Japanese students come from very collectivist cultures. I mean, there's another example. We are very individualistic. I mean, everything we do is about what's best for me. And our parents encourage us to do that. You know, my parents encourage me to go to college, even though they didn't have college degrees, and I've got more degree than a thermometer, you know, at this point. They encourage me to go do that, knowing that it could separate me from the family. That you wouldn't see that over there. Everything is about what's good for us. There's no me or my or I. It's us and we. That's why honor is so important there. What job you have reflects on your family. You know, your, who you date reflects on your family. All very, very important in a collectivist culture. Living at home, now their average marriage age is very close to our average marriage age, which is mid to late 20s. I don't believe all, I mean, yeah, there are child brides, and like you see, in, the National Geographic, but we have child brides in this country too, you know. It's not the norm. You don't walk around too much 12 year olds with grown dudes, you know, and Jordan. Um, they live at home until they get to be about 26 or 27 and they get married. Marriage is really important. Heterosexual marriage is really, really important. So they live at home until then, but then once you get married, and I'll show you some pictures of the town here in a minute, the males, the sons, are expected to move the next floor on the house. The family house. You move in, your family, and you live on that floor. And I remember we were driving on our way to the Bedouin village, and I kept seeing these houses that have four, one floor or two, and then they had pillars, just like unfinished construction. And I was wondering, what is going on with that? Well, they do that because they build onto the house as they can afford it, because credit is kind of sticky when you read the Quran. And, and I think Dylan's going to talk about that too. They really don't want to get credit as we know credit. So they build it. They build these floors so they can afford them, and you are expected to move in with your family. And then birth order, really, really important. 
And this has so much to do with masculinity and femininity. Firstborn sons are the sun, the moon, and the stars over there. You, when, when that firstborn son comes along, the mother and the father will change their names to father of, fill in the boy's name, mother of, fill in the boy's name, in Arabic. You know, they call them that in English. In Arabic, and that's your identity as a parent, is that firstborn son. I saw so many examples of firstborn sons being treated like gold. I mean, I remember being in the airport and I, I saw two fathers, two different families, only talking with their firstborn son. And everybody else is very accepting of it. I mean, that is the culture. Daughters are expected to listen to their, to their brothers. Brothers get to make the call, even when they're younger than, than the daughters. So this is from one of those non-government agencies I was telling you about. This is um, from the report to be a girl child, which you can get online. It is put out by the King Hussein Foundation. It was put out very recently. And they, they surveyed 2,000 parents, and they found that 89% of those parents believe that their girl children should be obedient to their brothers, no matter what. And those boys make the calls. I mean, if they go out in public, those boys will go with them. They get to decide if they go out in public or not. They decide if they gay. And those, those boys, and you know, there's a lot of pressure. And this is the thing, you know, I went to Jordan thinking I was going to learn all about women and girls because that's what the title of the lecture was. I learned so much about boys and what it means to be a man in Jordan and the kinds of pressures, you know, that must be on you, you know, as a man trying to live up to those things. Here's a quote from that same report. This expectation that a girl child must always have a constant male chaperone, especially when the chaperone is much younger, feeds into a belief that a female cannot take care of herself, and only in the presence of a male is she safe. This belief is carried out throughout her life and continues to disempower females of all ages. And I think that's the really important thing to think about is how much power do these girls feel like they have or don't have in, in their country. Now, I want to stop right now and say no one in Jordan is looking for any of the rest of us to sweep in and fix these issues for them. We heard that over and over again. They have plenty of non-government agencies working on these things, and they very much want to fix it from the inside out. So I'm going to give you a few examples, and I'll sit down and let Dileen talk a little bit. I could give you a lot of examples. The ones we're going to focus on are in dress, work, and free time. Please note Dr. Bourne is late. Um, <laughs> so let's start with dress. So we saw all kinds of styles of dress um, while we were in Jordan in the week that we were there. So let's talk about these different styles. I think a lot of people, and certainly me too, when I think Jordan or I think an Arab region, think this, you know? And this is actually what they sell <laughs> in the gift shops there to keep up, I guess, the ignorance of all those Americans that go over there. Uh, but this was very, this was really unusual. This is a Bedouin dress, okay? This, I didn't see a lot of this in the city at all. So let's talk through this. Okay, this is a Bedouin woman, and she, Bedouins take a lot of pride, and this is what they say, in allowing women to be um, leaders within their communities. Bedouins are native Jordanians. They're very, very proud of that. They're a semi-nomadic semi group. So um, they do move around with herds of sheep. They're sheep herders. The women are sheep herders. The men, I mean, you don't have to have a companion to be a female sheep herder. So this one right here was the president of her community. They have a community center, which they set up a computer lab in. I mean, they, they get together and, and make things. They um, are entrepreneurs. They make the, I got this for customs. Oh yeah, I guess it was okay. Um, don't turn me in if it's not. Um, they make these, uh, I don't know, sage or something? I'm not so good with this stuff. Maybe Ellen can tell you what it is. But it's some kind of, of a spice that they were making over there. And that's what they're standing in front of right there is where they were cooking this. Anybody recognize what that is? What? No, it's, I think it's sage. I can't, is, is it? Okay. Time. 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 Yeah. All right, there you go. Time. All right, that's what it was. But anyway, so her face is covered, but only a 
in front of men with whom she's not related. So I saw her without a face cover when we got into a room with just women. I saw her face uncovered. When she was on the women's side of the tent, her face was uncovered. But when she's in front of unrelated males, she must cover her face. That's how she and her tribe, that's how they interpret the Holy Quran. And so that's why they do it that way. The, the Holy Quran is just about modesty. I have a question about that. Uh -huh. When you were with that community, did you have to cover your head? No, we were never asked the entire time we were there to cover. The only time that we, was encouraged, we were encouraged is if we were going to go inside of a mosque, which I have a, I have a story about later. Big, yeah, right here. Um, okay, so this is, this is a Bedouin face cover. That thing is pretty warm. <laughs> it's thick. And it was as warm there in June as it is here, if not more so. Okay, this lady here is a professor at the University of Jordan. Huge, huge university there in Jordan. Um, she believes this is the correct interpretation, which it includes a solid color hijab and a robe that is not form-fitting, but she believes it is way over the top for women to cover their faces. She's very against that. But I asked her why this was okay, because <laughs> that's what I do, right? I asked her why this was okay, and she told me it's because she wants people to consider her mind first, and that this gives her that advantage. And so that's why she thinks this is okay, and this is how she interprets, you know, the, the law. Okay, this young lady here is a recent college graduate. She is holding up a doll, much like this one, which I just, I had to have this photo because it just cracks me up because the majority of women I saw were dressed like this, yet every doll you can buy and bring back to the United States looks like this. You know, so it was a big, it was really, that, it, was, it shook me a little bit. So um, this is how I saw most young ladies. Uh, they do cover their legs. Those are like, or no, those are like, they cover their legs and their arms, and they wear hijabs that are very fashionable. Like, they try to find a hijab that matches their outfits. So while I was there, um, one of the, Rasha wanted to put a hijab on me, and we're going to show video footage of that at the October 11th and 12th um, screenings. So a hijab involves this thing that goes under, over your, your hair, you pull your hair up in it, and your because you don't want to get this sweaty, right? So you put your hair up in it. These things came in all kinds of colors. You get them in lace. I mean, like two layers of lace. I mean, you go downtown, it's, it's shopping. Shopping's on, you know, looking for a job in downtown. And then, you know, they'll pick just a, which looks like a scarf. They just pick a scarf and they wrap it around and there's like all different kinds of ways you can do it. I mean, it's a real fashion sort of thing um, there with these. And then this one right here is every heir apparent's worst nightmare. That's all I can say. <laughs> right? She is wearing tight. She's beautiful. I mean, she's a beautiful woman, right? But she's wearing tight, tight jeans, a tight t-shirt with short sleeves. Her hair's not covered, and she's she's outspoken. And here's the funny thing about this: she works at the university in the American Center. <laughs> so it's like this is okay. But like I said, most women I saw were dressed like this. I saw a lot of men dressed like this. Not the tight jeans. <laughs> not, not like emo hanging out over in Not the tight jeans, but definitely the, the t-shirt showing their elbows and arms. Okay, so here's guys, how they dress. Now, yes, there is the robe and there is the head covering for guys. This is a bed one for guys. We were in the bed one. But the difference is, those robes are practical. They are thin, and they are cool. So it's like walking around in a nice summer dress, you know? It's just breezy, it's great. And a lot of guys in Jordan at the hotels, they would wear the white ones, and so you could see through them. I mean, that's how thin they were, right? They were wearing shorts and tank tops underneath those things. So they were really cool. Um, I mean, it's not cool, like awesome, but like cool, like, Weather cool, right? They might be cool, like awesome to you too, but they were very practical. This guy right here, we saw very few people dressed like this. He is a direct report to the king, has a lot of prestige in that country. Um, you know, for a man, if you can be an engineer or a doctor or a politician, that brings a lot of pride to your tribe. Men would rather not work than to bring dishonor upon their tribe. And that's one of the reasons why I saw so many men 
just hanging out in the streets, which I'll show you a picture of here in a minute. This guy right here is the filmmaker who made the film that we're going to show the 11th and 12th. He is a college professor at a smaller university there in Jordan. This is how I saw most guys dress. And the buttoned down, mostly long sleeve shirts, and he either had on pants or jeans, I mean, like, I don't know, pants, like dockers or jeans. This, this is what got me. And it gets a lot of people there. I mean, this is not, well, I, I should clarify, I saw a lot of people while I was in Jordan. I only saw three women who looked like that. You know, the tent, the moving tent, basically. Um, the, a lot of these women would have, the other two I saw, had to be led down the street by their hands, and they just have to trust the person like a guide dog, because there's so little you can see. If any of you have ever read A Thousand Splendid Sons, great, great book. If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. It's about women in Afghanistan. Great book. He talks, the author of that book talks in depth about what it means to be in one of these things. And Ken and I went and saw this guy not too long ago at Lawton, and uh, he said he got in one and just wanted to know what it was like, and that's how he was able to write about it. The great descriptor in that book. This was heartbreaking to me because it just seems so unfair. And a lot of people see this in that country, how unfair this is. This means femininity. I mean, this is what it means to be a woman. You know, this is, this is someone really following the Holy Quran and doing Allah's will, you know. But this guy would say he is too. And he's in short sleeves and a pair of jeans and far more comfortable, I would dare say, than, than this woman. And I just recently had a very long email exchange with a professor at the University of Jordan who was part of our seminar. And she says that um, this is the issue they're tackling, you know, is this, this double standard. But you have to do it from a very culturally sensitive viewpoint. Um, workplace. Close them again, and I need to wrap up. Workplace, I do want to point out that most women are in the private sphere. So here's that 62.4% are unemployed. They're working in their homes and they're not seeking employment. So most of the time when you're out looking in places of work, you're going to see men. You don't see a lot of women. Now, we saw a lot of women <laughs> as a part of our conference. We met all these women, you know, they're the lawyer, the professor, the entrepreneur, the politician, the registered nurse. But these are usually men's jobs in that country, except for the registered nurse. These are usually men's jobs. So what we saw was really unusual. It was cool. It was really cool, but really unusual. There is a mandate over there for how many women must be in parliament. That's why there's so many more women in, in their um, political government. That man, these women had some stories. Oh my gosh, they have some stories. This young lady right here is a Bedouin, and um, she is the youngest mayor I think the youngest mayor to ever be elected, and she was like 28 when she got elected. She was only 34 when we were there. It's kind of cool. We saw men everywhere. I mean, there, our tour guy was a man. The shop owner where we bought jewelry was a man. The character actors were men. I mean, we just saw men everywhere we went. Made for a very masculine society, you know, because you're just around dudes all the time. Who are around dudes, you know, all the time. Uh, feminine, uh, free time and femininity, you are expected to hang out with people who are your same sex from the time you're little, time you grew up. Um, especially important as, you're, as you get older. I would see some boys playing with these girls, but for the most part, it's the boys bossing them around, <laughs> not really playing with them, right? As girls get old into college age, you'll, they do come out in the public sphere a little bit, but once they get married, it's very likely they're going to go right back to the private sphere of the home, where they're going to be expected to hang out with other women from their tribe and cook for fun, you know, and, and embroider those robes for fun, you know, whether they want to or not. And that's the thing about feminism I want to make clear. It's about choice. And so if a woman wanted to stay home and embroider all day long, cool. As long as she got to make that choice, then, you know, that would be okay. Masculinity. Got a lot of pictures of guys hanging out. Like I said, they hang in, they just hang out, you know? Because a lot of these guys won't take jobs if they feel like they're beneath them. They wouldn't want their family, the family, the tribe wouldn't want them to do that. So I go downtown, all guys. We got stared at a lot in downtown. It was just me and one other woman. And it was like, it, I wouldn't say a mob scene, but it was very obvious that we were on display in the downtown area. Um, the bazaar. 
every store you go into that's like a bazaar kind of store, a large store, you're going to see a table full of men hanging out. Which, you know, we can see that around here too. There, there are all the tables with the dominoes and, you know, that sort of thing. If you're from a small town like I am, you'll certainly see those things. But this was really common. Every store I went into, these guys, guys like this were basically holding court. And here's the young guy just hanging out on the street. I, mean, I saw this all the time, just, just hanging out. And then these last guys are playing some sort of ball or something in, in, near in the neighborhood. Okay, one last thing. Don't stop. So what is the most feminine female in Jordan? What does it mean to be the most masculine male in Jordan? And these are extremes, because remember I told you no one's 100%. Okay. So to be a feminine female means you're subordinate to your brothers and any other men in your tribe. No matter what their age is, you're going to be subordinate to those guys. You're going to be heterosexual. There is no talk of homosexuality in Jordan at all. And I don't even think they believe like it exists. And then try to act like it doesn't exist. You dress modestly, which includes a solid color hijab. This is a little risque. All right, you, you got to keep it solid, preferably like a white or a or black. You need to spend most of your time in the private sphere. And this was a really big problem. They talked a lot about, in, in our sessions, about how women feel like they have to stay in the private sphere of the home or their neighborhood. And that movie we're going to show on the 11th and 12th goes into more depth about that in one particular city, what that looks like. Um, but we, we heard a lot about, about this. You can only visit the public sphere if you have a chaperone, if you're a virgin until you're married, and you're, you're married and you have male children. You don't stay single, but you definitely have some boy. Um, not having a boy could be grounds for divorce if you if you work it into if it's in the marriage contract. Marriage is a contract, and I think Eileen is going to talk about that. Um, but but it's your choice what's in that marriage contract. We really we very rarely heard anyone's forced to put particular things in the marriage contract. If you're the most masculine male, you are the first one boy in your family. You are heterosexual, and prove it. <laughs> you are you protect women, but you protect modest women. Women aren't modest, they're a little more fair game. So we did hear a lot from the college girls, the college young women. I, I enjoyed my time at the university immensely. These, these women were so outspoken. And that's what's really cool about Jordan is that the, the, the uh, population is very, very young. And so you keep hearing about this Arab Spring in Egypt, you know, and, and Lebanon and Syria. It's because the population is so young. Anyway, um, we heard from those college women that uh, if a woman is not modest, she will often get cat calls and that sort of thing when she goes down the street, especially if she's by herself. You just don't travel by yourself as a woman. That is not modest. You have a prestigious job as an engineer, a lawyer, a doctor. You spend time in the public sphere with other men, like grunting or, you know, whatever. Whatever you do, right? Playing ball, whatever. You are married and you have male children and you live in your family's home close to your tribe. And then there's one quote, and I will leave and let Dylene speak, and then we'll take more questions. There are clear inequalities that exist between boys and girls. As girls are viewed as a burden, they do not have self-confidence. They are viewed as fragile. They are, cannot take responsibility for themselves. They do not have the ability to make decisions. They are insignificant, and they should marry, become a skilled housewife, and a good mother. All right, so that's femininity and masculinity in Jordan. I do not want to leave you thinking that I think it's hopeless. I certainly don't think that at all. I was incredibly impressed with the work they're doing there. I mean, the fact that they brought in 15 faculty members from the United States and were willing to just be very open about what's going on and what they're working on, I thought it was commendable. I was very impressed. You know, their women's movement is so much younger than ours in this country. And it feels like they've accomplished so much more in a short amount of time. And I told them that, but they didn't want to, they didn't want to hear that. They're, it's never enough. You know, they're working really, really hard in Jordan. Okay, Dylene and Shurs. All right. Versus uh, someone in the pro arts, 
And I told Amy immediately, I don't think I'm a feminist, but I think she might have changed my mind, I have to admit. And I don't think I've ever heard a business professor use the word dude that many times. <laughs> Um, but I have to tell you that uh, I'm going to try to go a little more in depth. She did a great job of giving you an overview of what we saw. What I'm going to try to do is think a little bit about why the society is the way it is and um, try to put it in perspective. I'm a little more quantitative. She's a little more qualitative. So um, hopefully you'll get a full picture from it. I don't know. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint in the other location? No. Oh. We can't see it in the Eastern. Oh, yes, we can. And now, maybe if you get it broke up here, we have it. We have it, too. Okay, so you should have a picture of a couple of young ladies on the screen. And these were the ladies that I was paired with at the University of Georgia. And I found them just so delightful. And we had lunch with them. And, um, the girl on your right, I guess the shorter girl, was talking and she said, well, you know, what do you do for fun? And she said, I'd love to work out. I'm an aerobics instructor. And I said, oh, that's cool. I do Pilates. Um, you like to jog. And she just started laughing. And she said, what do you mean? Women can't jog in Jordan. And I said, well, what would happen if you went for a jog in Jordan? And I said, not by yourself, with other women or with a, even a guy, your brother or something. She said, you would, if I jog two miles, I would have 60 men following me, running beside me. She said, in fact, in Jordan, they have American young men, 24, 25 year old students, who went jogging, and it happened to them. So this whole idea of public space versus private space is really a big deal. And I think, think of yourself as a, as a, a young or a, a not so young person, not being able to go anywhere unless someone was willing to escort you. And even then, even if you had a brother or someone with you, you would be in danger. This harassment in the streets is a big issue, especially for women. The girl, the taller girl, the girl on the left, uh, talked her father into letting her work in a bookstore. And you have to remember, these, these young ladies are, are determined to change the way Jordan is. So she talked her father into letting her work in a bookstore with men because there are no women in the public sphere. She's the only girl working in this bookstore, and all of the people who come in are men. So the men come to buy books for their wives, but rarely do the women come looking for books. And I asked her, when they come looking for books, do you often, do they talk to you? I mean, is that like, do you get more sales because of their, you're a female, or do you get fewer sales, you know? It could work both ways. She said, um, some men will come in and there's a specialty area, I can't remember what hers was. She knows where everything is. But they wouldn't ask her. And they would go ask one of the other clerks, and the clerk would say, you really need to ask her because she, her section, I don't know. She said they would not talk to her. They wouldn't ask her where it was. Now, she works late. She gets off at 10 o'clock. They close the store at 10 p.m. So she's not off work until 11 p.m. And I said, how do you get home then? You know? And what the, if you want to employ a female in Jordan, you have to provide a ride home. So the, the owner of the store has a van, and he drops everybody who works there off at home to make sure they get home safe. And it's the only way she would be allowed to have that job in Jordan. So I thought, you know, there's so many things to talk about. We have such little time. I know I, Amy had the same, same problem. What do I share uh, in the little bit of time I have? And um, I know that because of harassment on the streets was so on the minds of these young ladies, and honor killings are interesting to Americans. We read about them in the news, we're so into them. I wanted to share a little bit with you about that. And it's interesting, the one fella who spoke to us, the, he came out of the box saying, in America, in America, domestic violence is so bad, and you guys think it's bad in Jordan, so, but I, uh, and I know it's really interesting to say that to a group full of American women, because you know, it was like, like down, maybe down, you know. <laughs> Please don't get us thrown in jail here. But <laughs> she uh, was awesome. And, uh, and, and, but it got me thinking, it really irritated me, but it got me thinking. So I came back to do some, a little bit of research, and I hope these numbers are right. I, I, I know there are people on our faculty who know the direct answer to this. This is what I got off the Department of Justice. So of the, 154 million women in America, 
1,181 of them are, in, are murdered by an intimate partner in the year. You can see what that percentage is. And 4.8 million uh, have physical assaults. In Jordan, it's 28 to 60. Now, why do we not know how many honor killings there are? Well, because there, it's so accepted part of the, it's, it's a difficult to get the statistics. Okay, so if I kill someone that I'm related to for honor reasons, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about whether that's really what it's for, but that's what I call it. I walk in and I hand my a weapon to the police. They hand me a cigar and they sit down and say, way to go. They call them honor healers. And they would say, okay, you have three months and probably it's probation, maybe a little bit of detention. Now they've upped this to 10 years in prison. So what's happened is they forced the younger boys to be the ones to do the honor killings because they're the minors. So the youngest son has to do this. Uh, and there are reasons. So we can you know, dig deeper and say, why is this? Now, an interesting difference between the United States and Jordan is that domestic violence is common. And if you look, I've seen some statistics uh, in America that up to 75% of women and children um, experience violence at home. It's up to 70% in Jordan. But if you look at the statistics in America, it usually is some sort of a sexual assault by an incest or rape by a, um, a family member. In Jordan, it's rarely sexual assault. They just beat them pretty regularly, okay? Um, and if there's a sexual assault, it's usually not by a family member, right? Um, and you dig deeper and say, why is this, okay? And these were some of the reasons we heard. The first one came from a study on female killings in Jordan. And the answer was, it's the man's responsibility to take vengeance because we have to protect this honor at all, all times. Men are the honor. So they are born, and immediately upon their birth, their family, because he was born, their family received honor because they had birthed a male child. Immediately, when a female child is birthed, that takes away from the honor of the family. So nothing that a female does will add to their honor. They can't get a better education, they can't get a better job, they can't do anything but produce a male child to receive honor and add to it. And it's really considered their obligation, so they just detract. And men, on the other hand, nothing they can do in their behavior takes away from this tribal honor. Now, I'm not sure, because I think you said we were only there a year and our subject matter was, was feminism, so it may be that if you cheat your neighbor, that's not considered honorable. And there are some things, perhaps, when men deal with each other that um, takes away from it. But certainly in the domestic realm, in the sexual realm, anything a man does will, will not affect the honor of the family. And I, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I, I want to tell this story because it was really kind of overwhelming to me. I had an opportunity to drive, go to Petra, and my taxi driver was from the Bedouin tribe in Petra, but I didn't know that. He um, picked us up and works for the Americans in the city in Drobus. So, you know, it was a four hour drive, we were visiting. He said, I really don't mind taking you to Petra because I, that's where I'm from and I'll drop you off and you'll go walk around for look at rocks for five hours and I'll get to go visit my family. And that's really cool. And uh, so he was excited and he had great English. And so we got to talking about his family. He basically was born to a family with four girls in it already. So he was the youngest and only male in the family. His mother died in childbirth, giving him birth. And his two older sisters were married when his father died. Okay, he couldn't make enough money to support the family um, in the Bedouin community, so he had to move to the city, had to learn English to make a better life for his family. Now, who is his family? Here we're talking about, he was like a teenager, 15, 16 years old. His family is his two unmarried sisters because he is responsible for them. He is responsible to take care of them. He is responsible to get them married off in an honorable way. And I asked him, um, well, he's, how old are you? He's 29 now. I said, one of the sisters is still unmarried. And I said, wow, you know, wouldn't you like to get married? When are you gonna get married? And he said, um, I can't get married. I can't get married until my sister gets married. So his happiness is put on hold 
and Sal said, sister gets married, so I'm feeling sorry for him. And I said, wow, that's unfortunate. You know, um, it seems like if you, you know, you're 29, surely you want to get married. Thinking, you know, there are things you can't do until you get married. <laughs> he said, um, oh no, I, I have lots of girlfriends. Things will pay for him to have lots of girlfriends. I said, well, how can you have girlfriends if none of the girls in Jordan can do this thing, right? Um, who are your girlfriends? Well, my girlfriends are foreigners, and there are a few girls in Jordan who will do this. So then he gets a phone call, and I said, who's on the phone? And he said that was my sister. She wanted to know if she could go to the store. Now realize, we're three and a half hours out of the city, and she's in Amman, and she needs to go to the store to cook his supper so that his supper's done when we get back. And he says, no, you can't go to the store. So I <laughs> couldn't help it. I'm like, why would you not let her go to the store? First of all, she has to call you to find out if she can go to the store. Remember, this is her younger brother. She's older than him. So she's somewhere in her 30s. She can't go to the store without his permission to cook his dinner. So I said, well, why would you tell her no? Are you not going to be hungry when you get home? I mean, what does it make no sense to me? You know, just like a little kid, he said, well, sometimes I'm just in a bad mood and I like to sell it home. Just to show her I can. So these, are, these sons get this power when they're four and five years old, and they enjoy it. Now, I certainly talked to a lot of the Bedouins boys there at Petra who hated their brothers having the power over them, right? So their fathers and their uncles and their older brothers, and they can't wait until they get old enough to be the person in power. So I asked him, well, how will you, how will you know if your sister does something inappropriate at the store when you're here? How do you know she's not going out? He has the neighbor spying on her, and when he gets home, he goes around and gets a report. And then, he was such a cute kid, he turned so dark and so black, and he said, if I hear when I get home that she has talked to a man, and I don't know if you can see in the other towns, but he went, I will slit her throat in a nanosecond, and be proud of it. And I mean, he meant it, you know? I'm like, I want to get out of the town. <laughs> you know? This guy means this. So I think that that's a great illustration of this point of how the honor thing works and what the responsibilities are divided among the boys and the girls. This uh, author of the murder, um, the murder by honor, uh, and as you can see, she she looks like any good old American. She went to school in Oklahoma. She said um, it's just a culture of violence. It's accepted. People solve their problems with violence here. The uh, the gentleman that. Um, was referred to earlier by Amy, who was the only gentleman who spoke to us, uh, said he thinks it's greed. Brothers are killing their sisters for their share of the inheritance, which I'm going to explain briefly here in a minute. They call it honor so that they have an excuse to do it and not go to jail. But truthfully, it's about money. Right? And the study they did shows that there is a high correlation between these honor crimes and poverty. 70 some, 3% of the victims and 66% of the perpetrators come from poverty stricken homes. So it was interesting to me, and of course, this might be because I'm a business professor, but the thing I heard in Jordan constantly was we have made so much progress. We've done civil legislation, our health conditions are better, our education is better, but our economic lives with our women have not changed. And if, if you look at these statistics, the, the average marriage for a woman at, in night, 30 years ago was 21, now it's 26. The life expectancy was 62, now it's 75. They don't have a bunch of babies, 3.8 births per, per woman. 90% um, of Jordanians have health care within three kilometers of their, of their home. 90% are literate. There are more girls going to college than boys. By all means, in many ways, this is a very progressive uh, society. But what hasn't changed is this economic activity. And if you see this, 30 years ago, 12% of the women were in the workforce, and in 2009, 15% were in the workforce. This is the one thing that they can't seem to fix. And they believe that if they get economic power, their women, it will change the status of the women in their society. 
part of the reason, and Amy already went over this, so I won't go over it for much, is just that it's, it's this idea of socialization from the time you're young. When parents were asked, what influences people's opinions about women and how you should raise your daughter? And they said, we listen first to tradition, second to society, third to our family. The last thing on the list, then it was the tribe, then it was media, and the law was actually the last thing on the list. And so what we found was law is not enforced in Jordan, and this is why there is no respect for the law. And even though you change laws, it doesn't make a difference. People pursue their claims through connections, not rights. So in our Bill of Rights, we say uh, we have inalienable rights, right? Simply because you're a human being, you have rights. They don't believe that, right? They believe that the only way to get anything done is to get favor with someone else who will help you get there. Um, and if a man wants to have a good relationship with his wife, he has to choose between his wife and the tribe. And a lot of times, if he chooses his wife, he won't get a job, he won't be able to move forward in life. One example is there, there's this idea that if you want a right, you have to have an obligation. So there's no right just because you're human. You only have rights because you have an obligation that follows it. So if I'm your guardian, uh, I have the right to be obeyed by you but then I have to provide for you just like my taxi driver. They have two courts, as she said. The civil courts govern the public life. The religious courts govern the domestic life. So in the civil courts, the only domestic stuff they see are disputes between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. So if a Christian marries a Muslim, they might end up in the civil courts. Um, although women lose their Christianity when they marry a Muslim. So it's really just the other way around, right? Um, and the legislation that they make in their parliament pertains to these courts, not the Sharia courts. So the religious courts are where the majority, as Amy said earlier, the majority of things are decided. Now, the big issue here is that all women's issues are considered domestic. Therefore, all women's issues are cited in the religious courts. So if a woman has a problem at work, it goes to the religious courts because it's a woman's problem or a child's problem. Uh, 80% of the cases in the Sharia courts are for women, but none of the judges are. In fact, no women are allowed to work in the courts. So no women are there to do the stenography. No women are there to be bailiffs. No women are allowed near the courts. So men are deciding the women's issues inside these courts. Now, it's much worse for someone who is a Christian or a Jew, and those are the only religions that they recognize. Any religion that can go back to Abraham is considered a religion. If you're a Buddhist there, it's just you're a non you're a non-religious person. And in their mind, then your only choice is to send you to your embassy. Let's say two people, two Buddhists get into a, a you know domestic quarrel or have a divorce, they have to go to their embassy and see a tribe. So what the people that are really in trouble are the Christians. Because, you know, and I think this hit me really hard. Honor killings are not a Muslim uh, thing. Christians perpetrate these crimes just as much as the Muslims, right? Because it's a, it's a societal thing, not a religious thing. And so what happens is, where do you go? Because you can't send a Christian to the Sharia law courts, and you can't send them to the civil courts. So they send them to the church. So imagine in your church, you have a dispute, divorce or any sort of dispute, you go to your pastor, and your pastor decides your dispute. How many of you think your pastor is prepared to handle your dispute? Well, when your pastor doesn't know what to do, they might send you to Damascus, they might send you to Jerusalem if you're Jew, they might send you to Rome even if you're in the Catholic Church, but there's no mechanism. So there are no qualifications for the judges, there's no appeals, and so people in the Christian community get by with it a lot more than in the Muslim community. But even when they make a law, they pretty much ignore it. So it's interesting, this fellow who came in said, Americans don't sign all these um, international conventions. They sign them all, they're very proud of them. Um, but we learned that they ignore their own laws. So when the members of parliament made a law about no smoking, immediately after passing the law, they went outside and smoked. It's like, it's, it's, like it's for show, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the disability law, this is where Amy did such a good job. She said, uh, if you sign this international convention on disability, 
why um, do I not see any wheelchair ramps? Why do I not see um, any, I mean, if you were disabled in that place, you would be in big trouble. And I want to show you this video, which is just an example of, how do I get So if you look at these, these streets, they're not very friendly to a disabled person. The um, curves are high. There's lots of cars and rubble and holes. There are um, lots of stairs. As you can see, Amy created quite a, a, got a lot of stairs as she walked along. A lot of stairs, S-T-A-I-R-S, <laughs> to go up and down and walk around. Um, they're not friendly to someone who happens to be disabled. So, um, another kind of interesting thing is that the criminal age in Jordan is seven years old. So there are no juvenile courts. And if a seven-year-old gets um, called in by the police for stealing or something, maybe they're hungry, lawyers are not allowed to go into the courtroom with them. So if you have a little seven-year-old in a criminal court alone, and not even able to have counsel with them. Now, the tribal inheritance laws, these are ladies in the tribe working, would say that man works outside the house, but he should get a third of the father's inheritance, family's inheritance, and the woman works outside of the house, but she should get a third. But when women come home, they do another third of the work inside the home. Therefore, in tribal law, and this is why the Bedouins, in many ways, have it better, they get two-thirds of the inheritance, the females do. The Islamic law, on the other hand, says, I'm gonna give my wife, only men are, are the only ones authorized to spend for the family. Women can't spend for the family, therefore the men should have a preponderance of money, right? So, I'm gonna give my girl children a third of my inheritance, and I'm gonna give my son two-thirds, okay? Because my girl children are gonna marry, and their husbands will have gotten two-thirds of their father's inheritance, and my son will marry a woman who's gotten third, and it's fair for that reason. So often, the women, as Amy alluded to earlier, in the, in the Bedouin communities have a better uh, financial situation than the women in the city. The women in government, this lady was one of the members of parliament, and if you'll see right here, they do a better job. The public sector being the government job are considered better jobs, and they work hard and they're quoted. And even in that case, they have obviously a lot better representation of females than the general public. And the politicians say that one of the reasons men don't want women in politics is because they're just naturally against corruption and they fight it. They don't like it, but they fight it. And, and the guys don't like that. They want them in power because the whole system is created by this nepotism, this family tribe connection. Another thing that I thought was really funny is that one of the MPs said, you know, the war in, uh, with the Palestinians has been very helpful for us because in the old days, in the mosques, they would rail against your women and men would go home after going to the mosque and beat their women because it was all, they always, that's what they would always talk about at the mosque. Now they talk about the war and they leave the women alone. So this was our window to uh, fix things. In women in business, they expect them to carry the burden, but they get none of the rewards. So for example, loans are written in women's names just as often as they are in men's names. And as you can see, women are much more likely to repay their loans than the men are. 99%, 78%. But women are not allowed to own anything. So only 17% of the people who own land are female. Only 22% of them are part of their own apartments are female. And as you can see the numbers. Entrepreneurs, 7% are female, but most of the time their husbands get tax credits for doing this, so they sign them up and register them in their name, and they don't even know that they own a business <laughs> because their name is just used. And certainly they never do um, have an opportunity to invest money because they don't have money. So this is one of the reasons women don't work, because one, they're not allowed to go out alone. They can't be at a meeting past 7 p.m. at night. 
They, have, they are not allowed to work where there are men, for the most part. Uh, and, but most importantly, they are not able to, to, take, to get their own money. So what happens is, young girls get educated, they go to the marriage contract, and the family of the girl will say, I won't let you marry her unless I continue to get 70% of her income. So she, in the marriage contract, she has to agree that she will continue to work until age of retirement there, which is 55. So I get married at 20, I have to agree, I will work to 55 and give 70% of my income back to my birth family. And the husband's family keeps the 30%. And the woman gets zero. So the women say, why would I work? There's no reason to work. There's no benefit to me for working. Women in education, I thought those of you who teach would enjoy this. When you look at the teaching assistant level, the assistant lecturer, even though remember, more women have college degrees. When you come down to assistant professors, look at the drop off. And when you go into an associate professor rank, it drops even further. And what we heard often was that female teachers are told what they can and can't say in the classroom. So if a female teacher wants to have a conversation or talk about and let you go, and then if other people have questions, we'll continue. So, questions, and we do have three sites, um, so we'll take one from each site and just cycle through that way, okay? We'll start here in Tahlequah, Ken. Well, actually, do any of the students have questions? Because I know many of you may need to leave at 315. Sorry, Ken. Okay, pass one. I was just curious because you used the Beyonce example. You said that they get the Western movies right off. Are the, in the music culture, are the same Western musicians not popular there? I, um, I didn't see that. Um, I had, I gave a flash drive to Rasha and I asked her to put some of her favorite music on it so I could just hear, and I said anything that's on your iPod. And she gave me all, it was all Arabic. I mean it was, you know, it wasn't all in Jordan. There's actually very few superstars from Jordan that she liked. And they were all from other Arab region, other countries, but. I guess they probably wouldn't play any American songs, perhaps. Well, and I even went in, you know, I went into the CD stores, and I didn't see any American CDs. It's all American movies. It's all American movies. JD, are you in this class? It's getting ready to have to go. No, I got a question. Okay, we'll move it up. Yeah. Can I move to another one? Will oh, you yeah. still be back when I come back to the, this site? Will you still be here when I come back? Because I'm going to move to the two other sites, and oh, then yeah. will you still be here? All right, okay. So, Dylan, you want to take a question from Broken Arrow, and then we'll take one from Eastern. I don't think we have any in Broken Arrow. Okay. Eastern, Chris, any of your folks have questions? Yes, and we're actually only left down to two. Everybody has to leave. But um, my vice president of academic affairs was wondering, was the mother of the king of Jordan American? And is that why possibly they're a little more progressive? Yeah, that's a question I would have to Google the answer to. Uh, Dylene, do you know the answer? Yes. Uh, no, she was, she was not American, although King Hussein did have an American wife. He had a British wife, and he had two wives from Jordan. Actually, he didn't have all those wives at the same time, though. He was really unlucky. They died fairly uh, in sequence. And I believe Abdullah's mother was the woman, either the woman from Britain or the woman, one of the women from, from Jordan. Um, you know, we, this multiple wives thing, I want to address that really quickly too. Um, Islam does allow for that, but I was just speaking with one of our Saudi Arabian students here on, on campus just a couple weeks ago about that, and he said what you really have to understand though is that you're expected, the husband is expected to provide for each one equally and to treat them equally. So he used the example of if you come home with McDonald's, which you could do in Saudi Arabia or Jordan, there were plenty of McDonald's, there were Subways, there were Burger King, there was KFC, there was, you name it, Popeye's Chicken. <laughs> it was all over there. And if you come home with McDonald's for one of your wives, you better go take some McDonald's to the other wife as well, because they will talk and you will pay <laughs> if, if you don't. So I think that's important to know as well. Okay, JD, that's oh, you the way. That. Hit, your, hit your buttons so Dylene can hear. Uh, you said that the, the movies over there, they have all of our movies, but they're all hard covered blob. Are the movies for the tourists, or do they partake and watch those too, and all the sex and killing and stuff? 
style and all that stuff? I got the impression that it was uh, the, the locals watching them. Um, because I, I did see one, and it um, <laughs> it was those bad pirated movies, right? Where there's like somebody videotaping the screen, and they are actually speaking in Arabic on the screen. So I'm guessing they're going into their theaters and recording the movies they had there. I wouldn't say they had every movie, you know, that we had in our theater this summer, but you know, they're super eight, and you know, the stuff that that's pretty well known. Dylene, you have anything to add on that? No, I was just thinking on the music question. I spent a lot of time in my hotel room because I couldn't sleep watching their music videos. They have them like in their version of MTV, and they were all about the, the husband trusting wife, the wife going out on him, him taking the kids. I mean, they were very, you know, this is what they worry about and think about all the time. Just speaking of watching TV in your hotel room, we had jet lag, I and mean, there's like an eight hour time difference. Was it eight? Was it, it might have been more than that. It took us like 14 yeah. hours by plane to get over there. But, um, so we were, we were messed up on our, on our sleep. But I watched a lot of CNN while I was there, and their CNN is much better than ours. Like, it didn't feel like it was as, I don't know, as edited, maybe. It was, I was CNN for English speakers. You know, it was, Engl it was in English. But it, I felt like I was getting more news over there. Uh, Connie? Oh, wait, was there someone in VA dialing that has a question? Jump in. I don't think so. Okay. Go ahead, Connie. You said earlier that they're primarily a collectivist culture. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, in, in their native language, um, do they use the pronoun we rather than the pronoun I? That's that's a great question. Uh, Dylene, I keep thinking about, um, oh, the lady from uh, Spelman. Okay. What was her name, do you remember? The professor from Spelman? Who was who grew up in the Arab region? Oh, yeah. I can't remember her name. Anyway, I'm gonna go see her when I'm at Atlanta in November, actually. But she was she grew up in an in an Arab family in, in an Arab region. And what she said was that they never use I or me. So I don't even know in the language. Is anyone familiar with Arabic? I, I don't even know in the language if there's words. I could ask my friend from Saudi Arabia. Yeah, go, yeah. In fact, I think it was your friend I was talking to about the mosque. Yeah. Uh, Amber, be sure to use the button. Can you tell us the mosque story? Tell you the mosque story, because you just like to embarrass me. Uh, oh, yeah, this good. was a huge. Yeah. Anybody can make. This is a huge ethnocentric moment. There's there's a, a buzzword for you, uh, intercultural folks. Ethnocentrism. Here's an example of it. And then, I'll, then you all can go, and so maybe your class is about finished. Um, so we were we were told to bring a scarf with us um, because if we ever had the opportunity to go into a mosque, we would need to cover. And so just about every day, we would all put a scarf around our necks or have one in our bag because we were waiting for the opportunity to get into a mosque, which we never really got that opportunity. So I was at a city park. We were all at a city park. We were beautiful murals of the timeline of the country, which took a while, okay, because the country is a little bit older than our country. Jesus kind of walked around there and stuff, so it's pretty old. And so it was this long mom, this long uh, mural. And I'm walking along, reading all the placards and everything, and I come to this placard about mosque, but it's in Arabic, and plus I'm going to those people at the museums who just kind of walks, you know, by, and they don't really stop and read things. So I see this door, and being the American that I am in the Disneyland uh, Silver Dollar City mentality that I have, you see a door, you see if you can go in and ride the ride, you know? I'm just, so I, I fiddle with the door, and it opened, and I just walked into the door. And it's, a, it's about the size of a closet. Moss there are not the size of a closet. They're gorgeous, gorgeous buildings. But it's about the size of a closet. I walk in, look up, and walk out. And the professor who had been with us, who's a, who's a Christian, actually, says, oh, Dr. Amy. <laughs> You have committed the worst sin. And, I, and then immediately I knew what had happened. I had walked into, it wasn't a real mosque. I mean, people don't go in there to pray, but it was representative of a mosque. I could see it on this mural. And I go, oh, no. And I had the scarf even around my neck. And I, like, throw it over my head. I'm like, what do I do now, you know? And she just keeps walking. Like, she doesn't want to be associated with this. She says, I guess you're going to have to pray to Allah. And I thought, I don't pray to Allah. <laughs> I don't know. What am I going to do? I don't, I don't even 
don't even, I don't, you know, I'm so, it was so confusing for me, and what do I do? But I initially asked Rasha to pray the law for forgiveness for me, because, you know, and tell her I didn't mean any disrespect to the country, but I felt horrible, and I felt a little ostracized by that professor. I mean, she really did not want to be a part of what I had just done, and we got along fine, and we actually got along fine afterwards, but she did not, I mean, it was... No, no, this is Sarah brings up this point. If, if she, if you were, I'm retelling it for people in Broken Arrow, if I had been seen, and I could have been, because there is private security everywhere. Not a lot of police presence. You know, we talk about enforcing laws. That's why people are just smoking in whatever building they want to smoke in, because there's no, there's not a police presence. No one's enforcing law. But when you go into government-owned places, there's a lot of private security. And that's where you see those guys with, like, big old guns strapped on them. You get used to seeing that. You know, um, but yeah, there were those guys there, and we really were special guests. And so there were only like the 15 of us in that whole park. And so yeah, imagine it could have been pretty bad for her. Yeah, not for me. Oh, well, let me let, let me say this. I think this is really important to know. I don't know, and and Dr. Betts told me this before I went that this was true that um, that Arabs are some of the nicest people you will ever meet, and I could not agree more with that statement. I felt so, it was my first time traveling overseas, I felt so welcome in that community and in that culture. They went out of their way to make sure that we were comfortable in everything we did. So I probably wouldn't have gone trouble with the private security. She might have though. I don't think they would take her life or anything, but it would have been embarrassing and honor so important, you know. So, um, John, I think you want to say something and I'm gonna let these intercultural folks go. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, what we, they did tell us that everybody we saw spoke English. Almost all of those women had come come to school somewhere, most likely in Canada or the U.S., and there were women who were not allowed to speak to us simply because we were Jewish. Yeah, that's true. Actually, the, the rudest people I ever met were the cab drivers, but um, isn't that <laughs> pretty far from the course? Yeah, you can get that in New York. <laughs> yeah. We're going to put this sign that she's going to post. Okay. So what we're doing right now is we're dismissing the intercultural class for anyone who needs to go. And then Dilene and I will stick around if there's anybody else who has who have any questions for us, okay?